Hey, Kim, what's on your radar this morning? Well, last week, when Joe Biden unveiled his vaccine mandates for all federal employees and businesses with over 100 employees, he uttered a truth that was really difficult for many of us to hear. This is not about freedom or personal choice. It's about protecting yourself and those around you, the people you work with, the people you care about, the people you love. My job as president is to protect all Americans. So tonight, I'm announcing that the Department of Labor is developing an emergency rule to require all employers with 100 or more employees that together employ over 80 million workers to ensure their workforces are fully vaccinated. So he says right there, it's not about your freedom. It's necessary to give up your bodily freedom for the greater good, he says. Now, we're all about wanting to protect our loved ones and even ourselves, really. But when the government tells us we need to give up our bodily freedom with the government's track record, should we automatically believe them? The U.S. government has never been very good at protecting the rights of an individual to control what happens to their own body. There is a long, sordid history. Just going back to the very beginning of our nation, the most egregious control over another person was, of course, slavery. The state wasn't short of any excuses. They claimed slaves were being cared for, clothed, fed, given religion. They claimed they were better off than poor workers in northern factories. And, of course, there was the claim that it was a matter of national security because we needed cheap goods. We couldn't rely on the British or any other foreign nation. And the state has been controlling what we can ingest with prohibition on alcohol and nowadays marijuana. We've been told it's for our own good to keep us from becoming addicts. And they would also claim that it isn't our right to be inebriated in public places. Who we can love has been regulated by the state. Interracial and gay marriage has been illegal at times in our nation's history. The excuse has always been that it's against nature, that genes shouldn't mix, or that it will corrupt the youth. People actually argued that being gay was contagious. Now, of course, a woman's right to choose has long also been under attack and still is today. Contraception was even once illegal. And of course, abortion is currently becoming less accessible in southern states. And the excuse is always to preserve life, or in the case of contraception, to not interfere in God's plan. Now, ironically, sterilization of young women was popular in the early 1900s and even up until the 70s. And talk about interfering with God's creations. Anyone who was institutionalized or considered less than in society could undergo forced sterilization. And the justification was to protect them from having children they couldn't care for and to protect society from people breeding who shouldn't be breeding. This eugenics movement lasted for decades and mostly affected poor women of color. In fact, the 1927 SCOTUS ruling that allowed for forced sterilization was particularly egregious. In Buck v. Bell, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote in his opinion, quote, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Jacobson versus Massachusetts. Three generations of imbeciles are enough, he wrote. So he cited Jacobson versus Massachusetts, the Supreme Court ruling in 1905 that found mandatory vaccinations were not in violation of the Constitution. That case involved a man named Henning Jacobson who refused the vaccine, claiming that he and his son had bad reactions in the past. And as a result, he was charged five dollars, which was the penalty in Massachusetts for not complying. Now, he took the case to court and he lost. The court ruled public health officials could do whatever they felt necessary to protect the public, which apparently later forced sterilization was considered part of that protection. Now, Jacobson versus Massachusetts is often being cited right now as a justification for why current vaccine mandates can hold. But we really need to put this ruling into context of the time period. I mean, we're talking about a time when women could not vote. Contraception and interracial marriage were crimes. Jim Crow laws were in effect. Also, at the same time, activists were trying for labor and wage reforms unsuccessfully. SCOTUS during this time was striking down laws that guaranteed minimum wage for women. They failed to uphold a law to prevent employers from demanding 60-hour work weeks, and they struck down a federal law regulating child labor. So it really, you know, was it really the early, um, it was really clear in the early 1900s, and really you could from the founding of the nation and even to today, that a free country has always been about a free enterprise, not really about a free people. 
Now, when you look at all of these past and current attempts to control another person's body, you will see that the poor are the most effective, affected. During the era of compulsory smallpox vaccination, it was pay a $5 fine, which is about equivalent to $100 today, or get the vaccine. With current vaccine mandates of measles and polio, et cetera, for school children, it's get your kids vaccinated or go to private or homeschool. It's a privilege of the wealthy to choose whether or not you get your kids vaccinated. And by the way, I'm just going to mention that school vaccine mandates do not exist in the UK, Canada, Australia or Scandinavia. Unvaccinated children go to public schools in those countries. Women in Texas who can no longer get an abortion after six weeks will, you know, just skip to another state if they have the money to do so. It's the poor women who are the ones stuck. Now, with these current mandates Biden just rolled out, it's get the vaccine or get a new job. And when you're living paycheck to paycheck, that's not really feasible. These mandates are going to disproportionately affect poor people of color who really value their bodily autonomy. And they're the ones being told they either do what the government says with their bodies or lose their jobs. So you might say, well, but public health is different. This is a virus that's spreading and you don't have the right to spread it to me. This is what Massachusetts argued during their time of the smallpox outbreak. Now, the smallpox fatality rate was between 15 and 30 percent. There was a real desire by the community and the individual to not get infected. The virus had been around for hundreds of years with various different types of inoculation that had been tried. The Chinese actually figured out that if you expose a person to a small amount of the virus, they could end up with a mild infection, and that would give them a 1 to 2 percent chance of death rather than 30 percent. And then in the late 1700s, a man named Dr. Edward Jenner discovered that you could instead infect a person with cowpox and get the same results. The person would get a mild illness illness and end up immune to smallpox. But immunity to the virus is the key. Smallpox vaccines like measles, polio and other vaccines cause a person to no longer be no longer become infected and stop the spread of the virus dead in its tracks. Now, this is how we have justified mandatory vaccinations for children in this country. But COVID vaccines, however, are not stopping the spread. We hoped that they would. Early reports claimed that they did. Then we hope they at least would significantly stop the spread. But with the number of breakthrough cases we're seeing in places like Israel, Iceland, Massachusetts, we now know they do not. Even communities with extremely high vaccination rates like private universities, which have mandated all students and staffs be vaccinated, are scrambling because of current outbreaks. Rice University, Duke, Chapman, Univers uh, Chapman University of Delaware, Connecticut College, all of these universities have vaccination rates among the students and staff that's above 90 percent, some as high as 98 percent. Nonetheless, they are experiencing outbreaks. Now, if the vaccine doesn't stop the spread, what justification do we have for these mandates? We know the vaccines are helping people who are vulnerable, who are in vulnerable categories, stay out of the hospitals and more. So it makes more sense to encourage those in the most vulnerable categories to get the vaccine and then donate the rest to the poor countries who haven't been able to even begin vaccinating their elderly. This makes the most sense than forcing healthy young populations with very little risk of hospitalization and, and death into giving up their bodily autonomy. Our history as a nation isn't so great when it comes to giving the people freedom over our bodies. Our, nations has, our nation has struggled with this concept since its inception. It's important we question and have these debates. When should the government be allowed to control our bodies and when should they not? Is there ever a time when it's okay? What level of severity and proof of necessity do they need to prove to us in order to justify ripping away our rights? So, uh, Ryan, I'll ask you about this. So COVID has a current death rate of 0.5 percent, which is much different than smallpox of 15 to 30 percent. And that 0.5 percent, by the way, is overall. We do know that for younger people, it's much, much lower. Uh, it obviously gets much higher as you get into the elderly population. It can go up to 14 percent for those who are above the age of 80. So what justification do we have at this point to continue these vaccine mandates when we know it is not stopping the spread? Well, a 0.5 percent death rate can still mean 10,000 people died last week. And the, 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 va the vaccines, though, are actually effective. So you talked about the outbreak at Duke, for instance. That's almost exclusively an outbreak among the unvaccinated. No, it isn't. There it's 2% of eight. the unvaccinated. No, no, 2% right. of the those eight, who have been infected are unvaccinated in eight, that outbreak. Eight cases. Eight, eight, eight total cases, cases out of 345. 
So eight, eight, eight cases, cases is not an outbreak. That's no, no, no. They had 345 that were that were diagnosed with COVID, and of only, of those, eight were unvaccinated. They had a two percent unvaccinated rate in the outbreak. No, no, no. Eight, eight were vaccinated. Eight, eight of those were vaccinated. Uh, eight eight no. were vaccinated, uh, okay. and none of those eight <laughs> went to sure the that hospital. That stat is inaccurate. Right, we could we can uh, maybe so the control room can check that. Check, check the Duke. Uh, they're they're checking on it right now. Yeah, but I, so, but I think more broadly, I think you make an interesting point. And, and I have seen uh, people, uh, t I have seen people who are speaking up on behalf of the unvaccinated, uh, referring to them as among this kind of marginalized or discriminated against community. And I do think there's something very American about that. Like we, we really enjoy this like oppression Olympics here in the United States. And I do think it's over the top to compare the unvaccinated to slavery or to eugenics or, or, to, or to victims of uh, other types of discrimination or oppression. You know, they're making a choice not to become vaccinated and they, and they want you know, the full ability to participate in public activity. And that's completely different than I think all of these other types of discriminations. Well, the element of this that really infuriates me is when Biden implemented or he announced his federal vaccine mandate and for companies, by the way, with employees over 100 um, and also all federal employees, what infuriates me about this is he is citing the authority of OSHA, of freaking right. OSHA, it's outrageous um, that he is giving, like that's what, when you wanna talk about sort of like the dissolution of our rights, the fact that he's citing emergency powers from the Department of Labor's OSHA agency to uh, implement a mandate this vast and sweeping, um, it, it speaks to, I think, the latent power of our federal bureaucracy to eat away at our rights. And I think, you know, you can have these conversations about localities, you can have these conversations, so like school boards mandating certain vaccinations, okay, states doing it, okay. The federal government under the authority of an agency in the Department of Labor run by unelected people, I think that is just completely outrageous. And that's what really gets me in the context of Kim's argument about um, the power to control people's bodily autonomy. The fact that the President of the United States is just sort of citing uh, OSHA is, I think, that is just completely outrageous. Probably will get yeah, struck down. Like, we'll right, see. Right, because it like, seems like OSHA, OSHA should, well, OSHA should really only be regulating your workplace, right? And so the vaccine you carry with you 24-7. So I think there's a really good argument to make that OSHA is overstepping its bounds. You're not at work 24-7. Uh, they can, I think, mandate, like, protective gear or, uh, you know, wearing masks and whatnot, but to ma to mandate a vaccine, I think you make a really good point, Emily. That's well, so what's what's most terrifying to me, I actually have a piece on the Federalist on this today, is that I don't know that OSHA is technically overstepping its boundaries because Congress has delegated a truly ridiculous amount of power to OSHA. If you look at the uh, legislation that OSHA was established with, it does delegate a, just a stupid amount of power to them. And so I think there's good legal arguments on both sides of it. But what is actually particularly terrifying is that OSHA might have this power that is unconstitutional, in my opinion, but that was sort of constitutionally delegated towards it. And it'll be interesting to sort of follow that case. Right. Uh, and so, so some stats from the control room. So eight, eight people were, un, were unvaccinated. A majority yeah. of the people were as, asymptomatic. So as of August 30th, 98% of students and 92% of employees were fully vaccinated, according to university press release. Michael Schoenfeld, vice president of public affairs and government relations, wrote an email to the Chronicle in late August that, quote, the majority of individuals who have had positive tests have been fully vaccinated. But if if most of them were asymptomatic and, and they're just doing like random testing to find out whether there are breakthrough cases, but nobody's dying and nobody's going to the hospital and nobody's getting right. sick, how, how are people using that as evidence that the vaccine doesn't work? No, no, I, I think you're confusing it. I think that those of us who say we shouldn't, that it should be a personal choice, we're saying it does work, obviously, to stop. I mean, we're seeing that data. We can't, we can't deny that data. It works. If you are in a vulnerable category, if you really fear for, your, for your, you know, the severity of COVID, you think you might end up in the hospital, you should really consider this. I'm not going to say you should do it or shouldn't. It's not my decision to interfere with you and your doctor. But 
the difference is the mandates are, okay, if I get the vaccine, then I can't spread it to you. But we're not seeing that actually be realistic. So it really should remain. And what my argument is, is that it should remain a personal decision that you make to keep you yourself safe. You're not going to keep other people safe from you, but you very well might might lessen your chance of going to the hospital and ending up sick. And that is something, you know, that's a message I feel like people really need to hear because my worry is people are getting this this idea that if they're vaccinated, they're safe. They can go around grandma. And I'm saying, no, you cannot. And that is dangerous to think you can, to think that you're not carrying the virus and you might not infect your grandmother. You might. And now we know that these vaccines are wearing off a bit and grandma got it first, right? She got it back in maybe January, February. She might be very vulnerable. And so people need to know about this so that they can make educated decisions on how they behave in their life and also educated informed consent decisions about their own personal medical decisions. But he, here's one more layer to that. If, if, the, ch if the chance of getting infection isn't zero, and, it, and you're, you're obviously 100% right. correct that it's, it's, it's not zero, you can still get in, infected and you can still spread it even if you're vaccinated, but the chance that you'll get infected is significantly lower. So we don't really know that yet. We don't know that yet. It's, it's still a little too early. I think there's maybe some early ideas that it might help slow the spread. But, they, you know, they've said like back in February, March and April, they said you won't get it. And then they started to say, OK, well, you can, but maybe it'll be lessened. And we're not really seeing evidence of that when we look at like Iceland's data, for example. So we don't really know yet. Let me let me try one uh, one pro vaccination argument out on you and see see how you see how you think this one flies. <laughs> it's like so, I'm on a game show. So yeah, so let, let, let's 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 think of this as a national mobilization. I don't like to think of everything in yeah. terms of war, but right. <laughs> some type of national mobilization where we are confronting an, an enemy that is at the at this point killing ten thousand you know people a week in the United States, and if say we are going to war, there, and there's a draft. People know that if they're going to get drafted or if they're going to serve in the military, that 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 there is some risk uh, right. in, inherent in that. But because it's a national mobilization, because the entire country and community is coming together to to defeat this thing that is a, that is attacking the country, that is attacking us, that it is worth taking some modest level of risk if you're if you're doing it for the community, if you're doing it for the country. Sure. So I'm against uh, mandatory drafts. So it, you know, that, so that right there, I would say, if you are signing up for the military, right, so you know forget, that so you're the, giving right, your exactly product. the draft aside, right. but serving right. the country, like the idea of a so service that comes right. with risk. But that's a choice. So if I choose to join the military, which I have chosen that at one point in my life, believe it or not. So if I choose to join the military, then I know I'm giving my body up for them to even uh, to, for uh, the ultimate sacrifice, which is my life. So, you know, that's where I would say, again, if, the, you know, I get your, your point that you say, well, you know, we all have to work together in order to eradicate the virus. But I'm saying the vaccine's not sterilizing. It's not eradicating the virus. So that isn't, you know, we have to move to a different form of combating this, which would be um, treatments for people that are getting sick, potentially. But I mean, look, if you're, you're vaccinated, I would assume against measles, I think most of us are. Um, I'm not worried when I travel around the world, for example, I don't ask people, hey, have you had the measles vaccine? And if not, you know, I don't know if I can step in an elevator with you or go anywhere with you. Right. I mean, I know I'm protected because I had the vaccine. That's how vaccines should work. Right. So, I mean, but it was fun. That was a fun game show. Yes. <laughs> Let's try again tomorrow. Leave it there. <laughs> All right. I think we have Emily's radar coming up next, right? Yep. All right. That's Looking right. forward to that.